never supposed to be this way Look in the mirror but you find someone You never thought you'd be Oh but I can still recognize The one I love in your tears and eyes I know you might not see it now So lift your eyes to me When you see broken beyond repair I see healing beyond
Good morning and welcome to Westside. It's great to be in the house of the Lord this morning out of the cold. We're still having winter. We love Indiana, don't we? It's good to be in God's presence and we want him to have permission. We want to give him permission to do what he wants to do this morning. So sing this with us. Here we go. We surrender. We surrender all to you. Do what you want to. Do what you want to. God, we long to see you move. Do what you want to. Do what One more time. You want to. We surrender all to you. Do what you want to. Do what you want to. Of him. Isn't it good to be together? God's presence is here. God's presence is down near Columbus where a group of our ladies have gathered for a time of renewal and retreat. And it's good that God's presence is enough for everyone, isn't it? We are your church. We are your sons and daughters. We've gathered
Shame. 
faces, but does anybody agree with that this morning? Was anybody's life saved because of his blood? Mine was. for prayer thank you Jesus that we can say we live in victory because of you because of us we live in failure because of what we uh, our mistakes our sins our problems we are failures but thanks be to God because of your blood we live in victory Jesus thank you so much that we don't have to live in our past but we can live in the future that you have for us because you are a good God who loves us and covers our sin thank you Jesus so much for what you did for us on the cross. As we head into an Easter season, Lord, it seems like we, we get extra special or, or extra sensitive to that kind of language. We talk about the cross and, and, and your sacrifice. And I pray, Lord, that this season be no exception, that we uh, focus more clearly on what it means that you died for us and you love us and you sacrificed for us. It changes everything. And we need that, Jesus. That gives us hope. That gives us peace. That gives us every good thing that comes from you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for that. And like Katie said, it's because of your blood, only your blood, that we're saved. It's only you, Jesus. There is no other name of which man or woman is saved but by yours, Jesus, because of what you did on the cross for us. So we lift up your name today, your name only above all other names above all other things, all other pursuits, all other dreams. It's you, Jesus, and we thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you that we can even boldly approach you and reach to you and pray to you. You're so gracious you allow us to do that. We don't even deserve that right, but you give it to us. Thank you, Lord. Uh, we can't even begin to describe how grateful we are for what you've done. And I pray, Lord, for anybody in this room who has no idea what I'm talking about, 
I pray that no one leave this room today without encountering you and giving their heart to you and understanding more deeply what it means to have your blood cover their sin, to have your grace forgive them, to have your name, Jesus, above all other names in their life. And I pray, Lord, as we move on through this through this service, that as you're already speaking, you would be clear to us, each of us, what you'd have us to do, the step you'd have us to take, the decision you'd have us to make praise you'd have us to give. Father, we want to be obedient to you because good things happen when we obey you. We thank you, Lord, again, for your grace, for your forgiveness, for all that you've done and all that you continue to do. You are a good God, and we thank you. And we give you every right and our permission, Lord, to rearrange our hearts and minds for you. It's a good place to be, and we desire to live in that reality. Thank you, Father, for this moments to pray. And all God's people said together with me, amen. Amen. Isn't God just good today? Good, good, good. Every day, every day. Want we'll to let the kids go, all kids, sixth grade and younger, head on over to the kids' sign with Pastor Nate. Greet one another for two minutes. We'll be back for the offering, the message, and some announcements in two minutes. See you then. When death was arrested in my life, was redeemed only beauty remains and my orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet my feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began folks we're going to be back in 60 seconds for the offering and the announcement 60 You all may be seated here this morning. Let me just go ahead and add my welcome. I'm so glad that you're with us today as we continue in worship. Ushers, you can come forward as we prepare for our tithes and offerings. If you're a guest with us today, we just want to say welcome and thank you so much for being here. There's a card in the pew in front of you. If you could fill that out for us, and then after service, take it to the guest kiosk. We have a gift we want to get in your hands, meet you, answer any questions that you might have for us. We would be honored to do that, and that would be a great way for you to get connected here at Westside. It's hard to believe, at least for me, but we're just a few weeks away from Palm Sunday and Easter right after that, and, and we have a lot of great things planned for this Easter season, and we're excited about it. We want you to be a part of it. And so, if you didn't get one already last week, we have these invitation cards. We'd love for you to pick one up today, and just be in prayer of maybe there's someone in your life, maybe a coworker, a friend, or, or a neighbor that you can invite to an Easter service. There's a great thing about these cards, and they just tear off like that. I was real nervous it wouldn't work but it's that easy and this is a great way for you to invite someone and just for them to be aware of what all is going on in this Easter season so just be in prayer about that maybe this year this Easter through your invitation there's someone that might know Jesus and that's what it's all about and so we're excited about that then two weeks after Easter we're starting a, a brand new Sunday school class called next steps and the information's up on the screen if you're new to faith or new to the church just kind of trying to figure out what this whole Christianity and church thing is all about this is the class for you and we're really excited about this opportunity uh, just to answer questions just to kind of go through the basics of, of what is this faith all about what, what are the things that we need to know in order to to make these decisions. And if so if that's something that maybe you'd be interested in doing, you can RSVP right now. Text that number up on the screen and uh, you can get on the list and, and just get that all sorted out. It's going to be a great, great opportunity. We're excited about that and I uh, hope you join it. It's going to be a great thing. Let me pray as we prepare to hear from Pastor Dave this morning. God, we just thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for these people and, and for your plan for each one of us. 
God, as we prepare for Easter and just uh, prepare for this great day, we, we, we ask that you would just start preparing our hearts or that you would just make us aware of your love each and every day. We pray this all in your name. Amen. You, especially if you're a guest with us, good to be with you. You know, we're missing today. We're missing all our ladies down at the ladies' retreat. About 40 of them down there. Hopefully, they're having a good time. And I see all kinds of guys around here. Like, oh, just can't wait for the wife to get home. <laughs> Have a good, good day. Hey, join me in praying for something. Would you join me? I'm being a little sarcastic here in praying for these first five pew rows. Evidently, no one wants to sit here. You get earworms or something if you sit there. So we're praying over these. No, I'm kidding. It'd be great to see that populated some weeks. I'm not going to call you to preach or read, I promise. But we'd love to see you down in front here. Anyways, just for fun. We're in the 12 disciples. We have three to go. Actually, today... and two more to go. Let me remind you of the 12 disciples, the original 12 apostles. We've been studying their lives, some stories about them, how they died, how they lived, but really it's ultimately about how we can be better disciples for Jesus following in their steps and their, foot, their footprints. All the guys in gray we've already done. Next week we're going to talk about Thomas, doubting Thomas. Is he doubting or faithful? We'll find out next week. Then the following week, Palm Sunday, we're going to talk about Judas and how we too betrayed Jesus and how we have betrayed and can be forgiven, be a great, uh, he's, he's obviously fascinating, so that would be an interesting day. But today we're going to talk about the Mac Daddy, the big dog, the top cheese, Peter. If you're from New England, Peter. If you're from uh, anywhere else, it's Peter. He is the most famous of the disciples. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of famous Peters, right? You got your Peter Cottontail, your Peter Pan, your Pete Rose, your Peter Paul and Mary, your Peter Brady, lots of good Peters out there. Peter Frampton, lots of good Peters. But no doubt, the most famous Peter who has ever lived has got to be the Apostle Peter. He is widely known. He's impacted the world for Jesus. He's a uh, popular known guy. So let's, let me give you a little biography of him, and then we'll, we'll dive in. Does some great stuff today. First of all, let me show you where he is on the Last Supper. Go ahead and light him up there. He is... Two seats to the side there, to Jesus' right on your left. He's the guy with the, the white beard, white hair. Da Vinci painted him that way because we believe he was older than the disciples. How old? We have no idea. We just believe he was one of the elder, you know, statesmen, elder leaders in that group. John was probably the younger, youngest. Peter may have been the oldest. That's why he painted him that way. We know lots about Peter. Some of the disciples, we know very little to none, and I had to like stretch some sermons out to fill some stuff out, although it's been all great. This guy, Peter, he's mentioned in the Bible 189 times. We're going to be here for like three months. It's a lot of stuff. We're going to boil it down, but we know a lot about him. Let me share some stuff with you. First of all, his name is Simon or Simeon. That's his given name. Jesus will change that name to Peter. We'll tell you all about that. His job was a fisherman. He and his brother Andrew were fishermen. As a matter of fact, the Bible shows that he and James and John, their families were in cahoots. They ran a business together. It was a fairly large business. They had a fleet. I'm not sure how many, but they had multiple ships and a staff, and they were wealthy. They, 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 were, they were a business family. He was a fisherman, and uh, he knew how to fish. He knew how to rod and reel and tackle and all that stuff, okay? Uh, his brother is Andrew, who was also one of the disciples. We talked about him several weeks ago. He's got some namesakes after him. As a matter of fact, lots of things are named after him. I looked it up online, and the list is like super, super, super long. There are cities named after him, buildings, churches, hospitals, all kinds of stuff. You ever been to St. Pete, Florida? That's the guy named after him. There's like, I think, 100 St. Petersburgs all over the world and monasteries. Did you know that there's a St. Pete, Indiana? There is, named after him. Did you know that? Anybody been there? Nobody goes there. You get stuck there, I think. It's like that kind of town, one of those small places. Uh, his symbol is the cross keys. Now, I'll tell you about this in a little bit, but really it symbolizes that Jesus says to him, that I give you the keys to heaven and earth, and the gold key symbolizes heaven, and the silver key symbolizes earth. We'll read that passage in just a little bit. There are some books in the Bible he wrote. He wrote First Peter and Second Peter. He did write those at an elderly when he's older in age, now when you read the books of First and Second Peter, you should read that, remembering that he's an older guy now. 
he's matured in his faith and he's matured in his uh, life with God and his discipleship and he's got some great wisdom to share he's not the young impetuous guy he was in the gospels he's an older wiser grandpa it's good 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 stuff someday we'll probably study it together and I believe is my thought I think with many scholars that he was influential in the book of Mark he may have been the author he may have been the one who dictated it or if nothing else I think he was a heavy source for the book of Mark we don't know for sure just a speculation I have find out in heaven there's lots of stuff that only he would know in there he's got a nickname uh, The Rock right not the guy who's like on the Hollywood rock guy but he's got the rock we'll talk about that and he's the leader he is the leader of the disciples he's the leader of the church every team needs a leader every team needs a leader the disciples are a team and Jesus knows that when he dies and resurrects and goes to heaven and leaves them that they're going to need a leader Peter's the guy every team needs a human leader ultimately Jesus is in charge amen Jesus is the leader of every family, every church, everything. He's over all. But Jesus puts in charge of organizations and families and churches a human leader. And in, Peter was the leader of the disciples. And we live in a world, I think, that hates leadership. Everybody wants to be their own boss. Everybody wants to criticize leaders. Everybody wants to tell leaders what to do. But we believe in leadership. God is in charge, and he sets the world up in such a way that the gates of hell will not prevail. You'll see about that as we go. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. Peter, in the Bible, is kind of like two Peters. Not two different people, but two forms of Peter. There's before resurrection Peter, in which he was, uh, he, he was rash, he was quick, he had a lot of failures and a lot of stumbles. That's Peter before Jesus' death and resurrection. After Peter's death and resurrection, and you can read about in the book of the Acts and bunch of New Testament and of course his books first and second Peter he's mature Peter wise Peter leader Peter filled with the Holy Spirit Peter that's a great Peter but I'm going to focus on the guy before Easter who G who Peter was when he was first called and leading up to Jesus resurrection and we see a lot of his failures he's said many times that Peter was just one of those guys who kept failing over and over and over again but I want you to know he doesn't fail more than the normal guy or gal we just have a lot more of his story so we see it. If we had your whole story, we'd see a bunch of failures too. If you have my story, you see a bunch of failures. So, but Peter is kind of portrayed in the Gospels in many ways, one including that he's quick to action and sometimes doesn't quite get it right. And then Jesus corrects him. You'll see that as we go. So a handful of stories, not all 189 of them, but a handful. There's some great stuff. Stick with me. Buckle your seatbelt because we are moving, baby. All right. This is his calling. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him we have found the Messiah. This is right after Andrew is called by Jesus to be a disciple himself. That's Peter's brother. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John, and you will be called Peter. So Andrew goes and gets Peter. Simon at that point introduces him to Jesus. And he gets a new name. He's called Peter, meaning that he's going to be a new person. This often happens to the disciples, not all of them, but so it's not a formula that we have to follow. But sometimes Jesus says, you are going to change. I'm going to change your life. You're going to be different than what you used to be. So we're giving you a new name. That's what Jesus is going to do to Simon here. That's why he gets a new name, Peter. And uh, uh, Pe Peter means, the, the name Peter means rock. It comes from the Greek Petra, or your version of the Bible may call it Cephas. It's all the same. It means the rock. And we give nicknames to people. Well, we give nicknames to people who have special skills, people we hate, people we love, okay? And, and Jesus has a plan for him, and he loves him, so he gives him this nickname. Do you remember the old rock, the Christian rock group, Petra? Anybody remember them? I, I, when I was a youth pastor, this has been about 20 years ago. I was a youth pastor in Maryland. It was a Sunday night. I was at my house. I think it was like 7 or 8 o'clock at night. We are at home. I got a call from Petra. Yeah, the rock group, Petra. This is when they were kind of on their, their day was closing, and they called and said, Pastor Dave, we have a cancellation next Sunday night. One of you would like to have our group come out to your youth group. I was like, yeah, cool. They said, be 2500 bucks. I said, oh, that's a lot of money. So I called a, a leader in the church and said, hey, this would be cool. Will you pay for it? He said, absolutely. So we called uh, Petra back and said, we got you. They came seven days later. I had 900 at youth group that night. No joke. It was pretty chaotic week, but it was a lot of fun. But Petra, the rock, that's who this guy is. I tell you that story because that's the only spot I could ever, ever tell that story. 
And pastors, we have stories. So there you go. <laughs> uh, anyway, so there's more to his calling. Luke 5 gives some more of it. Luke 5 says this. As Jesus was teaching, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. At the water's edge, he saw two boats. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon. Okay, they know each other at this point, but here's some more of his calling. And asked him to pull out a little from the shore, just a, just a bit out. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out in the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, 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 come on. We worked hard all night, haven't caught anything. We know fishing, buddy. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. That's a lot of fish. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats on the shore, left everything, and followed him. Now, let me show you something here. Visually, you see all these yellow words of Simon. His name is Simon. This, this is really like, if I have to say, it's probably like his, his salvation moment, his deep calling. That's why Jesus uses the word Simon a lot. He's calling him from Simon to becoming Peter. That's why, and then the Bible continues to use, call him Peter after that. Although sometimes the word Simon is used as well. Okay, so let's, let's run through this and see what happens. Uh, he's, Jesus is preaching. He's on the shore. There's so many people there that he thinks, let's go on the boat. Let's just kind of get away from the shore, make it like an amphitheater. More people can hear and see, and that's what he does. And they preach, and then he says to Peter, let's, let's pull out and go fishing. Let's go fishing, Peter. Now, is Jesus a fisherman? No. Jesus is a carpenter. Is Peter a fisherman? Yes. Is Andrew a fisherman? Yes. Is James and John fishermen? They know fishing, okay? But Jesus says, we want to go fishing. Now they're like, Jesus, come on, man. Now, if we were going to build something with hammer and saw, we would talk to you. But, buddy, we know fishing. We've been out all night. The fish aren't biting. This is not our first rodeo. It's not our first trip. Nobody, they're not biting. I, this, this is a waste. I think that's going through their mind, okay? Now, but... He says, in a moment of faith, which is awesome, he says, but you're the master, we'll give it a shot. Like flicker of faith in his life. Let me just say this to all of us. Good things happen when we do what Jesus says. Amen? Even though we don't understand it, even though we think we know better than Jesus, even though we're experts in it, good things happen when we do what Jesus says. Now, but all night, this is a little symbolic, they've been fishing all night and they have nothing, no fish, no guppies, no minnows, nothing, just Zilch. That is symbolic of what they've done with their life, spiritually speaking, up to this point. There's no, there's no fruit for their labor with Jesus or with God so far. It's been an empty net. And then Jesus has them put the nets in the water, and they bring up so much fish that the boats are sinking. That's a big deal. We better get these things ashore. It's also symbolic of all the people that they're going to lead to Jesus. That, that's what's happening in, in the fish deal there, okay? And it was their biggest load ever ever and these guys have fished for years families have fished for decades probably biggest load they've ever seen they're blown away the peter's response is go away go away i'm a sinful man i don't deserve to be around you okay this is uh peter's simply afraid that once jesus gets to know him that he won't measure up i think that's what's going on and jesus says to him don't be afraid I know your past. I know who you are. You don't need to be afraid of me. I'm not enough to get you. I was not to get you. That happened a long time ago. Your past, Peter, does not disqualify you. Folks, remember that. You're going to see it again in this story. His past does not disqualify him. Neither does yours, okay? And this is Peter's first brush with Jesus giving him forgiveness and grace, and it won't be his last. And he says, from now on, you're going to fish for people. We're not going to catch you know, salmon or cod or whatever's in the, I don't know what they're fishing for out there, you know, grouper, whatever they're fishing for, none of that anymore. We're going for people. We're going to make lasting impact on people. I'm changing everything for you. And they follow him. Let me just remind you, the disciples, that's what we do. They get out of the boat and they follow him. Too many disciples in the church, in a church, perhaps even in our church, are just sitting in the boat. When Jesus says, let's get out of the boat and go do something. I don't want an empty net in my life. I want a full net for Jesus. Don't you? Amen? Got to get out of the boat is the point. It costs them everything. It costs these guys everything. It says they, they pulled up their boats and they left everything. Everything. 
the boats, the fish, the nets, everything. Think about this. They didn't say, Jesus, we're down. We will follow you. But I need three months. I mean, this is a big load of fish. We've got to, like, clean these fish. We've got to sell them. We've got to take them to market. That's going to take some time. We've got to take our nets. We've got to put them on Craigslist. got to find a buyer. We've got to put our boats on eBay. That takes some time. We've got to transfer the title. They could have said, like, this is going to take some time. We're down, but it'll take three months. They did not do that. They ditched it all right there in the shore. Now, I'm sure that the business, like, took care of all that, and their dad, Zebedee, and everybody took care of it, you know, but they left everything. It is costly, and they go immediately, okay? Now, let's see some of his failures following this. This is his great confession. This is from uh, Matthew 16. Jesus asked his disciples, it's, it's class time, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Well, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, your rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Peter, he took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All right, classroom time. First question Jesus asks is, who do people say that I am? What's the word on the street? What are you hearing? And they give like the answers that culture is saying. Some people say you're Elijah, and some say this, and some people say this. Even today, if you just poll people, they'll give you all kinds of answers of who we think Jesus is. The second question, Jesus wants to get specific, and he says to the 12 disciples, now, forget all that stuff. Don't quote anybody. Don't tell me what other people think. Who do you? Who do you say that I am? The 12 of you want you to answer. Jesus wants to know what they think, and Peter speaks up. Leaders speak up. They don't always have to be first, but he's first here. He speaks up, he's, he jumps in, and he nails it. Bam, nailed it. He gets it right in the first shot. And Jesus explains his name. He says, you got it right, and you're blessed because of that. And you will be the leader, and you will be a rock. And on you, Peter, when I'm dead and gone and resurrected like he tells them, he says, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build it on you. You're going to be a leader. You're going to be a foundational element. Peter doesn't save anybody. Peter's not God, but he, Peter's the leader that God chooses to lead amongst other leaders. He says, you will be the rock. And then Jesus gives them the plan. He says, now, actually, how would you feel if Jesus said that to you? You're the man. You're the woman. I'm going to build everything on you. I'll tell you how Peter felt. Pretty darn good about himself right there. Pretty proud, wouldn't you? I'm sure Jesus saw this coming because here's what happens. Jesus says, all right, here's what's going to happen, guys. I'm going to Jerusalem. They're going to whip me. They're going to beat me. They're going to flog me. They're going to crucify me. They're going to kill me. And then I'll come back to life. Now, they didn't hear the come back to life part. They heard all this killing stuff. And Peter, in a moment of pride, says, I'm the rock. I'm the leader. Better step up. And he pulls Jesus aside from the other guys so they don't hear it. He puts his time around Jesus. Hey, Jesus, this is not going to happen. That plan you have is stupid. This is not going to happen. We're going to take over. We're going to leave. We're going to be a big deal, okay? That, that's what he says. And Jesus then says to him, you are Satan. Get behind me. So now he goes from Simon to Peter to Satan. When you're a disciple and Jesus calls you the devil, it's not a good day. <laughs> not a good day for him, okay? If we work against the plans of God, even if we're leaders, even if God is using us, even if we're influential among anybody, if we work against God's plans, we are not on God's team. We are satanic in nature is what he's saying there. And then he says disciples do three things. Deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow him. We deny ourselves. Peter had a plan for Jesus. Everybody's got a plan for Jesus. Everybody's got a plan. But disciples abandon their plan, deny their plan, follow Jesus. They take up their cross. We live sacrificially, and we deny ourselves, and we follow him. When, when we say we follow Jesus, that means we go where Jesus would go and do what Jesus would do. Where does he go? To the cross, to sacrifice. That's what it means to be a disciple, to be sacrificial. Here's a good question to ask yourself every once in a while. 
Have you sacrificed anything lately for Jesus? Have you? I don't know what he's asked you to sacrifice, but it's a good discipleship checkup question every once in a while. Here's another one. He walks on water. Peter does. Watch this. And he has a little failure here. Jesus made the disciples get onto a boat. This is Matthew 14, by the way. And they go ahead of them to the other side of the lake while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed the crowd and the disciples, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So that's a storm that's happening there. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake, walking on the lake, not next to it, not near it, on it, on top. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, on the water, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come out to you on the water. Well, come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they climbed onto the boat, the wind died down, and they worshiped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So they're out in the boat in the middle of the night. Jesus is praying. In the middle of the night, Jesus walks to them. I don't know if he's intentionally trying to freak them out, but I'd be freaked out too in the middle of the night if I saw something walking on the water. All they can come up with is, this is a ghost. Something's happening here, okay? They're fishermen. They probably heard all kinds of fish stories and that kind of crazy stuff, so they've, they've got this in their mind. And uh, they, somebody, he says, it's Jesus. And Peter cries out, if it's you, prove it. Call me to come out there. He believes that miraculous things happen when Jesus is around. They're just getting a taste of that. Call me out there. and we'll Prove that you prove that's who you are. And Jesus says this one line, this one word, come, that he keeps saying to the disciples. Have you noticed that in this series? He keeps saying to them, come. They, they'll ask, where are you staying? Come and see. Can we learn about you? Come and learn. Come and follow. Come follow me. He keeps saying the words, come. Jesus is an invitational God. It doesn't matter what's happened in your life. Jesus doesn't look at you and say, stop. He doesn't. Ever. I don't see. He never says that. He says, come. Let's change who you are. Let's change your life. Come to me. That's what he says. So Peter does that. Peter gets out of the boat. He's the only one who does. Hops out of the boat. I don't know if he hopped out with, you know, energetically or he did one of these things. I don't know what he did, but he's on the water and he starts walking. Okay, and it's amazing. He's walking towards Jesus, and then I don't know if the wind comes and hits him. It's like you know, blows him around a little bit, and he realizes, yeah, this is not normal. This is weird, and he starts to sink. And he's going to drown. A fisherman who can't swim. That's odd to me. <laughs> Maybe we should stay on, stay in the business side of the business. Then he says, he's drowning. Lord, help me. God, Jesus reaches down and lifeguards him up, saves him up there. Okay. And some people criticize him. Even Jesus says, why did you doubt? I'll tell you about that in a second. But I think some people criticize, says, I have to criticize what he did. And true, he failed here, but he took a couple steps. It's way more than any of us have ever taken. So give him credit. He takes that first step in faith. He's out there in faith. Maybe a couple steps in faith. And then he loses faith. Here's the point. God wants us to not just have faith for that first step. For the second the third and ongoing. Now, I'll tell you the truth. Sometimes being a disciple, there's easy moments, but sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you need faith for that first step, and the second step doesn't get easier, and the third step doesn't get easier. This is a hard thing to deny yourself and follow Jesus. It is hard to live sacrificial. You need to have faith for every step. Now, let's, let's, let's linger for a moment in Luke 22, because this is a chapter full of his failures, and, and uh, we're going to somewhere awesome with all this, though. Look at this, chapter 22 of Luke, way after he's been with Jesus three years now. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Now, in the yellow, you see it there? Simon, three times. I thought he was Peter. Yes. The reason he's drilling this name is Simon, Simon, Simon. You're about to do something that you used to do. You're Peter, and I'm changing you, but you're about to have a moment in which you revert back to your old way of life. That's why he uses the word Simon for him here multiple times to kind of drill this home. That's his old name. He's going to think and act and talk 
in ways that he used to before Jesus was his Savior. You ever have a moment like that? Oh, yeah, we all have. Maybe this morning, I don't know. We're following Jesus, we're loving Jesus, and something happens and we revert back to a way that doesn't honor God in our language, and our thoughts. We do something, we see something, we go somewhere. Who, who knows? Who knows? That, that's what's happening to Peter right here. And he says, Satan wants to sift you. There's only a couple people in the Bible that Satan has asked God permission to deal with. One was a guy named Job. And another one here is Peter. Now, let me be clear with you. You need to understand the importance of this. There is only one Satan. Don't think about him wrong, okay? You have probably never, ever, ever met him, okay? I know we talk about Satan everywhere, and I get, I get the, the, the mindset of that, but there's one. He's a created person. He is not a god. He has no powers. He can't be everywhere at once. He's like me or you, one place. That's really how that works, okay? There's one of him. So if you're on his radar... <laughs> that's a big deal it's a big deal he can only focus on one guy and right here he's focusing on Peter because God has big 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 plans for him let me let you know though that Satan does have a whole system in place and the Sunday after Easter for four weeks I'm, I'm putting together a sermon series right now I'm calling it Satan's Schemes four ways he's trying to destroy your life and we're going to look at those for the four Sundays after Easter it's going to be very like demonic four weeks I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm trying to wake you up. Okay. No, I'll be mean, very hope filled, but we're going to deal with that. So, Peter's response is Lord, I'm not going to deny you. What are you talking about? I will go to prison for you. I will die for you. Now, that's a big commitment. That's a big commitment. You can depend on me, Jesus. And Jesus predicts the future. He's, you know, Peter, I know the future. God knows all things. You're going to deny me three times. And here's what Jesus says that's haunted me this week. But I have prayed for you, Pete Simon, that your faith may not fail. Your faith may not fail. I, I'm wrestling through that a little bit. I think that means, like Peter, we love Jesus and are devoted, devote followers of him, and we can have failures. It doesn't mean we've lost our faith in him. If you're a Christian, and you mess up, and sometimes you go back to your old way of life, it needs to be repented of. It needs to be dealt with. Absolutely. But it doesn't mean you've lost your faith. It means you've begun that process. But Jesus is praying that your faith may not fail. Even though you get in a moment and you need to rely on me, I pray that you come back to me and you repent to me and your faith stays intact and that you don't run from me the opposite direction. Fascinating. Okay. Then it goes on. Uh, this is the prayer section, okay? Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane. This is after the Last Supper. Judas has already left to betray him, and his disciples followed him. He said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. You know why? Because it's coming in just a couple minutes. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will but yours be done. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. That's intense. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep. Why are you sleeping, he's asked. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Now, the other stories in the gospel tell us this is how it works. They get to the garden. There's 11 disciples at this point because Judas is gone and Jesus. Eight of them are like at the entrance praying. He takes three of them, Peter, James, and John, a little bit deeper into the, the garden to pray because they're closer to him. And then Jesus goes further in to pray by himself. He says, everybody wants you to pray. It's a big deal what's going on now. It's late. They're tired. We need to pray so that we won't fall into temptation. Hey, who's your prayer partner? Do you have a prayer partner? I wonder if your, your wife or your husband's your prayer partner or a friend or somebody in Sunday school. I count on all of you to be prayer partners for me. I'm your pastor. I need you to pray for me in all that I do. And I, I think we need to have prayer partners. Do you know who Jesus' prayer partner was? Peter. And guess what Peter was doing when Jesus said, I need you to pray for me. Sleeping. How would you feel if your prayer partner slept? If you call him and says, hey, I'm sick. I'm going under surgery. Will you pray for me? And they went to bed. How would you feel about that? Oh, not very good. No, not very good. So that's what's happening here. He's, he's, sleep, he's sleeping on Jesus, and he should have been praying because temptation is coming. Let me show you. Here's what happens. So after, right after this, while he was still speaking, a crowd came up, uh, a crowd of soldiers and uh, thugs to take Jesus, and Judas was one of the 12. He was leading them. That's fast. I just now saw that. That's fascinating that Peter is leading the church to honor God and Judas is leading the non-church to kill Jesus. That's fascinating. Turn a little. 
he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When the Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? Peter struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this, stop. And he touched the man's ear and he healed him. Now we'll get to Judas in two weeks. He's a fascinating story. We'll deal with him in two weeks. But the crowd comes. They're going to arrest Jesus. There were swords and pitchforks and all that. I mean, it's a mob that's come for Jesus, okay? And they're being ready to grab him. And all the disciples say, they're talking about, well, what should we do? Jesus, do you want us to fight? What should we do? And Peter's not talking. He whips his sword out and swipes and cuts an ear off. Terrible aim. Just awful aim. <laughs> a terrible aim. Stick with the fishing pole, Peter. The sword is not your gig, okay? And do you know why he sprung into action? Well, leaders do that. I get that. Been not, you know what would have been nice? Leaders spring into action after they pray. After they pray. That's why Jesus was saying pray because temptation is coming. Temptation to do something stupid or wrong or ungodly is coming. Not only in that moment, but in ongoing. He wasn't prayed up, and temptation came and took him, okay? And then he cuts this guy's ear. I don't know if he cut it off, or he cut it in half, or he sliced it, or he pierced it. I don't know what he did. But Jesus then you know, picks the ear up or touches his head and heals him. And that tells us something about Jesus, doesn't it? This man has come to arrest Jesus and murder him, and Jesus heals him. That's cool. That's cool. That's powerful. That's the God we serve then here's what happens it goes on to his denials they led Jesus away and took him to the house of the high priest so this whole crowd they take him to the high priest for a court they're going to try him for to, to crucify him Peter followed at a distance so he's following but just far enough away that there's not a great association and when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together Peter sat down with them a servant girl looked closely at him and said Hey, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him. That's one. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you're also one of them. Man, I'm not, Peter replied. That's two. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he's a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. That's three. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter then Peter remembered the word of the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today. He would have sown me three times, and he went outside and wept bitterly. We know from the Gospels that John is also there. John and Peter, the only disciples here at this scene. Peter's outside, and three times they say, you were with him, and three times he denies Jesus. From the other Gospels, we can even see that the third time he cusses everybody out. What is he doing? He's going back to his old way of life, talking like a sailor. That's what he's doing. That's who he was. He's cussing everybody out. I don't know this guy, and he's cursing, and he's making vows, and he's just going berserk, berserk, okay? That, that's what he's doing here. And I find this interesting. Let me, let me just, don't let this be lost on you. Peter's this fisherman guy. He's probably got scars and wounds and tough, and he's strong from lifting that. He's big dude, big beard, big tough guy. You get that image of him, and he's taken down by a junior high girl. That's totally what happens right there. Because this girl had no power. In that culture, women had no authority. Okay, I'm not saying that should be. I'm just saying that's what it was. Young people had no authority. So she was a girl, no authority. She was a young person, no authority. And she was a servant. No, and she had nothing on, on him. You know what he could have said? He could have said, yeah, I was with him. And she'd been like, okay. That's probably how that would have shaken down. Because it was not illegal for him to be a disciple of Jesus. He wasn't even under the threat of certain punishment. He was just under the threat of uh, potential something. Who knows what it could be? They could be mad at me. They could, they could arrest me. Who knows what's going to go on here? But he wasn't under the threat. But when this, this lady, this junior high girl gives it to him, he crumbles. He was the first to confess that Jesus is the Messiah. And now he's the first to deny that he knows him. Even the best among us fail. We don't want to fail, but I want to be clear, even the best among us have moments of failures. We've all made vows to God like Peter did. He made baptism vows or church membership vows, marriage vows, Christian vows, covenants with God. We make these vows and promises to God, pledges and commitments. How are we doing on those? And we stumble, and we need God's help. When we deny Jesus, know this, he does not deny us. You're going to see it go on there. 
just in the rooster crows. And one of the most powerful images in the whole Bible happens right here. The rooster crows, Peter the rock has denied Jesus, and Jesus is on the opposite side of the courtyard, and they lock eyes. Ouch. Ouch. How does Peter feel about that? He weeps bitterly at what he's done. Now, let me just say this. Peter's a grown man, and grown men don't cry a lot. But when confronted with their depths of their sin, it's a righteous thing for a man to be broken. Or a woman. Because sin is a real thing, and it separates us from a heavenly God who loves us. And when we deny him and betray him and sin against him, it's a grown-up thing to deal with that and be broken by it because God receives us back. The good news is it doesn't take him five months or five years. It takes him like five seconds. He deals with that, and that's repentance at its finest. Now, let me show you one of my favorite things about Peter in the whole Bible. i got two last things to show with you, then we'll be done, okay? Mark chapter 16. This is awesome. It's Easter Sunday morning, very early on the first day of the week. got Sunday, Easter Sunday, just after sunrise. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, well, who's going to roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And they entered the tomb. They saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You were looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified? He is risen. He's not here. This is the great news. We'll get there in Easter. See the place where they laid him? Now, look, at this is my line I love so much. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Now, you know what this line could have said? Go tell his disciples. It why does he add, and Peter? Isn't Peter a disciple? Yeah. Everybody knew Peter failed. Jesus knew Peter failed. This angel knew Peter failed. All of heaven knew Peter failed. And everybody wanted to remind Peter that you are a disciple. Go tell the disciples, and especially you tell Peter, God's going to meet him in Galilee. Peter, you've not failed to the point that your failures have disqualified you. Your failures in the last 24 hours have not. God has a plan. He wants to see you, baby. I love that. That is so cool that he points him out because of this failure. Now, let me give you the last story of him. This is Jesus is reinstating Peter. So he's had this big failure. He's running. He thinks life's over. I can't be the rock anymore. God's not going to use me. And God, re Jesus reinstates him as the leader in front of everybody because Peter's failure was in front of everybody. Jesus reinstates him in front of everybody. Look at this. This, this, is, this is where we'll land. Jesus appeared by, to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, and two other disciples were together. Well, I'm going to fish. Peter said, I don't know what else to do. We're going to fish. Peter told them, and they said, well, we'll go with you. They went out, but at night, that night they caught nothing. By the way, this is going to sound eerily familiar to all the stories we've just read. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. Throw your net in the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then John said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Peter heard him saying, it's the Lord, he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed him in the boat. And Jesus said to Peter, do you love me more than these? Well, yeah, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my lambs. Second time, Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Third time, he said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter was hurt this time because Jesus had asked him three times, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know what my life was before? You knew I was going to deny you. You just know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said, follow me. Now, some of that sounds familiar. Let me show you, okay? So they, uh, they're in Galilee because the angel said, go to Galilee, wait for Jesus. They're there. They don't know what to do. They're just waiting. Maybe he'll show up. They know the fishing area, so that's where they're at. That's where their boats are. That's where their people are. And they go fishing. Sound familiar? That's what he was doing the first time Jesus met him. He's out fishing. Which, which is interesting to me because he's supposed to be building the church, leading these guys to build the church. Instead, he leads them to go fishing. But they're just kind of waiting. They're not sure what to do. That night, they caught nothing. Sound familiar? 
Yeah, like the story earlier. They were out fishing, got nothing. We were fishing all night. We got nothing, okay? Then Jesus comes with some fishing advice. That sound familiar? Yeah, hey, throw your nets on the other side. Oh, yeah, thanks, crazy person. Yeah, like the fish are here, but they're not here, right? But they do it, which is funny because, again, there's a flicker of hope that maybe, maybe, you can hear it in there, like, and sound familiar, this flicker of hope. Then the fish come in, more fish than they expected all night. Sound familiar? Of course. And then they say it's the Lord. And as soon as Peter hears that it's Jesus, he jumps into the water. He jumps into the water, not onto the water, just so we're all clear, okay? And he swims to, swims to the shore. He just there, he leaves all these guys, leaves everything behind, doesn't care about the fish, doesn't care about the guys. He wants to see Jesus. And then Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Do you know why he asked him three times? Because Peter denied Jesus three times. All public, he's just kind of matching his, bringing him back, okay? And then he says, Peter, feed my sheep, tend to my lambs, take care of my sheep. In other words, he, Jesus used the imagery of the church as like a flock. You know, we still use that language. And he says, Peter, you're the shepherd. I'm leaving. You're in charge. I know you've had failures, but you're going to do okay. We'll help you. The Holy Spirit will be with you. You know, it's amazing that Jesus forgives people. What's also amazing is he lets those forgiven people tell others about forgiveness. It's amazing that God brings people into his flock it's also amazing that some of those people, he lets to shepherd the flock in many ways, small ways and large ways. Pete, uh, here's Peter's, Peter's uh, epitaph could be, uh, I denied Jesus, now I'm in charge. <laughs> it's amazing that that happened for him. Uh, and then he says how he will die. He says, you know, when you're old, people will take you where you don't want to go and dress you the way you don't want to dress. Here's what happened. And Peter, at the end of his life, he lives a long life and long ministry and does great things and becomes faithful to God, but he's like a thorn in the side of the government officials, and they hate this Jesus talk, and they hate it, hate it, hate it. They come to Peter one day, and they say, Peter, stop. We're going to kill you. As a matter of fact, we want you to deny Jesus now, or we will kill you. You did it once, do it again. And Peter says, nope, not going to do it. Let's crucify me right now. And so they go to crucify him, and Peter says, I'm not worthy to be crucified in the same way that Jesus was, so hang me upside down. And they do that, which is why often you'll see those keys or Peter with a, holding an upside-down cross. That's not being rude. That's just the way he died, and that's how he died. He died not denying Jesus but trusting in Jesus. And I can imagine. Can you imagine this? I don't know if this happens, but in my mind's eye, I can imagine that the moment he died here and entered into heaven, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And he says, you know, I do. Isn't that amazing? That's the kind of God we serve. Let me say this in closing. Peter had his list of failures. There's a lot of them. And he has his list of his successes too. And God keeps saying, your failures don't define you. Your sin does not disqualify you. I'll keep forgiving you again and again and loving you and molding you and making you, and I can use you. Some of you in this room, some, all of us maybe, have sin in our life and wonder, can God do anything with us? Does my sin disqualify me? I've got this. I, I was once a bad guy, a bad gal. I don't want to be that again. Can that disqualify me but God uses people who are broken and wounded and weak to do amazing things don't take that lightly that is you when you leave this room today and go live for Jesus follow him go where he would go do what he would do he loves you he's counting on you amen on your feet Jesus thank you so much for the word today of Peter and his story but ultimately about you and I pray Lord you would help us even in our own failures, to know that you bring us back and you help us. And we're not all exactly like Peter, but we all have had our failures. We all need your forgiveness. I pray, Lord, that none of us, through our failures, have our faith dissolved, but we keep returning to you and keep growing in you. And our faith is strengthened so we can live for you and never deny you and by our words or our actions. I pray that for every person in this room that they would live for you this week knowing that you build a church on us. You use us and you need us and you want us. And we thank you, Lord, for that opportunity to serve you. And we pray this in your name. And all God's people said, amen. Have a great week. The Lord's using you. And may the peace of Jesus Christ be with you all. See you soon. Have a great day.